glorious grace. That's how Paul described it. In that scripture, he didn't say saving grace, which it is. He didn't say miraculous grace, which it is. He didn't say powerful grace. He said glorious grace. In other words, this is something that shines through our darkness. When we think about God's glory, we think about the light of God. We think about the evidence of God's presence. Whenever we think about the glory, we think about the glory cloud. We think of how uh, God's people have been led by his glory, can see his glory. And so this is how Paul describes grace. When we are in a place that is dark, where we're in a place that's confused, when we are in a place where we can feel trampled, it's the glory of God's grace that hits us. And it's the remarkable truth that God comes to us in power, no matter where we are, no matter what we've done. That's what's so glorious about it. God doesn't give up. It reminds me of Psalm 23, where um, it says that surely God's goodness will follow us, but the word is more powerful in the original language. It says, pursue us. Can you imagine the goodness, the grace of God pursuing us? Like we're running away from it and he is pursuing us. How often can we be tricked into thinking that the darkness is something that the Lord doesn't have? And we can wander off and despite the fact that we're wandering off, God is pursuing us. He won't let us go. Glorious grace. Glorious grace. The goodness of God. And God does this, and we talked about this in the, in the reading as well, because we belong to him. The scripture says that we are adopted as his children. Powerful thing to be adopted. That gives us a brand new identity. And you've got to think about the time when this was written in Roman times. Adoption was incredible. Caesars used to adopt people, and then once they were adopted, they became the next ruler. For example, Augustus Caesar adopted Tiberius. That was a big thing, because once he was adopted, he became the next emperor. You've got to think in those sort of terms. When Paul is saying that we are adopted by the king, by the emperor, that's the sort of thing that's in the background, in the mind of the people that are hearing it. A king adopts us as his very own. That gives us unbelievable rights, gives us unbelievable privileges. We are now defined by who we are in Christ because he says so, because he made it so, because he adopted us. That's incredible. So it doesn't matter what we think about ourselves. This is the reality. This is who we are. And we are that because God made it so. God made it happen. God chose us and he decided that we would be his. Not just now, not just tomorrow, but forever. And the original hearers would have also understood that if somebody is adopted, they become a brand new person legally. What was before, any things that they mucked up, any debts that they would have had, they would have been forgotten and there would be a brand new identity. Goodness me, sometimes I feel like I need a new identity. Goodness me, sometimes I look back and think, did I make that mess? Gee, I would love a new identity. And all I have to do is hear these words from Paul that say that I have this new identity in Christ and this is who I am because God says so. And it's a wonderful thing to be chosen by God. Just let that sink in for a second, that we are chosen by God. Sometimes... I feel like I'm never chosen for anything. I feel like I'm the leftover. 
You ever felt like you're the leftover? I've felt plenty of times like I'm the leftover. Um, when we were at school, it'd be lunchtime and we'd have a game that we'd have to play. And if it was a sporting game, we'd pick two captains. It'd be John and Mark because they were the big sporty guys and everybody looked up to them because they were the ants' pants when it comes to... And they used to pick the teams. Did you ever have this when you were at school? And so you're all standing there and you're waiting to be picked. This one gets picked and this one gets picked. And I was the kid that was waiting there at the end, hoping that the numbers were even. Because if they were odd, it'd be, ah, uh, you're the last one and it's odd numbers. Can't you? you can be the ref, right? Who wants to be the ref when you're 13? Refs don't make any friends. You know how they say, you don't make friends with salad? Well, you don't make friends being the ref either. And sometimes I would feel like I was the leftover. Everybody else was picked. And I was left over. Superfluous to the needs. Almost included out of pity rather than for who I was. That can be a painful experience. I don't know if you ever had that experience. But I can feel like that in life too. I can feel like good stuff is happening to everybody else and I'm the leftover. Why is God picking all these people and he's leaving me over here? You felt like that. Don't tell me you haven't. You're all humans. We all live in the same world and we can experience feeling leftover. Not chosen, not cherished, but we can feel leftover. And God says, that's not the truth. You are living a lie. When we think that, when we feel that, we are allowing the attacks of the evil one. We're allowing the darkness that does live in the world to interfere with our minds, to interfere with our soul. Because when we acknowledge, this is who I am, because God says so, I am his workmanship, because he says so, I am his treasured possession, because he says so, I will inherit all the riches of heaven, because he said so. I have the Holy Spirit living in me, because he said so. That changes how we act. It changes how we look at the world. I don't feel like I'm a leftover anymore. Because while people in the world can look at me like a leftover, the one person that really matters is God. And I know how he sees me. He doesn't see me as a leftover. He sees me as his treasure. He sees me as the most important person in his life. And let's be honest. We all want that. We want to be treasured by somebody. It's a human desire. I want somebody to come and grab me and treasure me and adore me. We have that desire. And yet our human relationships let us down. Sometimes they can do that. Sometimes they don't. God won't let us down. And we can live in that security. We can live knowing that this is who we are. And when we do that, it's glorious. It's glorious because just as Paul says in other places, I'm not concerned then about what other people think. I only want to be close to God, my Savior, who has given me this gift, who has adopted me as his child. And that's how I want to live. And sometimes people will love me for that and sometimes they won't. But it's not going to define who I am. What defines who I am is what God says and what he's doing. And that's how I'm going to live. It's a beautiful thing. As Paul says in Ephesians 1, 6, it's glorious to live like that. It's glorious. It gives us a whole different 
mindset, a confidence, and a belief that God is not just for us with his favour, but he's at work going before us. This is the way God encourages us. This is what it is to live grace. Not to just say grace is something that's forensic. God is real, God is real and his grace is real and it makes a material difference in what happens to us each day. This thing called grace. We can't get our heads around it. Because did you watch that video? Did you think it was right that the kid got ice cream after he mucked up? You see, I'm a parent. I didn't like that at all. That wouldn't have happened to my children, I can tell you. There would be no ice cream. If they came home and they did something that was terrible, there would have been some sort of consequence, you see. We just can't get our heads around the fact that God says the consequences... won't be born by you, but will be born by me. What that video left out was that the dad said, I'm going to lock myself up for two days. That's what God says. I am going to be grounded. I'm going to ground myself. That's what he's... Because this is what Jesus did. He says that whatever consequences come from the things that we do, how we stray from him and his will. He says, I will take those consequences. That's the crazy thing about grace. Not that there are no consequences, just they don't fall on us. God says, they will fall on me because I treasure you, because I've adopted you and you are special and I choose to take this burden. What a fantastic parent. I choose to take this burden. My father was not a Christian man, and I've talked about him a few times because he's a quite remarkable chap. And I was one of these very uh, blessed people who had a fairly idyllic childhood. And my father was a good man. Um, he was born in the 1930s, so he had a different worldview than I guess I have, and yet he was instrumental in the person that I am. Extraordinary, beautiful man that he was. And he understood grace, even though he was not a Christian. And there was a house that we lived in for a long time, beautiful house, you know, very comfortable. And right next to the house was a driveway. And at the end of the driveway, was a carport with a huge concrete slab, big enough for two cars, and then a big, big driveway. And of course, when I was a young, young man, or as a, a boy, young man, I didn't see this as a carport and a driveway. Do you know what I saw it as? Cricket pitch. This was designed as a cricket pitch. That's all I could see, how fantastic beautiful concrete surface, nice run-up. We could play wonderful cricket here repeatedly. And the fact that it was a carport, I mean, it had a roof on it, batsmen never got hot, standing in the sun, it was ideal. I think it was a carport, so it didn't have walls on it. Anyway, so my friends and I are playing cricket there with a hard ball. And my dad pulls up after work and says, what are you doing? We're playing cricket. He says, you can't play cricket there because that hard ball is going to go through the window. He said, what I'm asking you to do is not play cricket here. Righto, Dad. Well, Dad was out. The next day, guess what we did? We played cricket there. Does that surprise you? We played cricket there again. I heard Dad's car coming from work. Oh, Dad's coming, quick. And so we ran inside. Dad pulled up. The next day, we played cricket again. Dad comes around the corner, and his car, quick. 
We all went into my bedroom pretending nothing's going on. On the fourth day, we played cricket, and my cousin, he was a terrific batter. We bowled this ball, and I wanted to get it up near his throat, you know, because I wanted to... It was a bit of a show-off, and I wanted to bounce him, but he just went smack. And you know where the hard ball went? Straight through the window. And Dad came home. We were nowhere to be seen, right? <laughs> nowhere. I was at my friend's place. Mum said, your son, your son and his idiot mates broke the window. I had to come home at some point, right? Dad knew, no good chasing me. Eventually I had to come home. I was terrified when I come home. What is my father going to do? I came home and Dad didn't yell at me, didn't scream at me. He sat down and he said, how come you didn't listen to me? And that was really hard. What is it about us and what is it about me as your father that you didn't think my words were important? Oh, you know how hard that was to hear? I would have preferred him just to give me a good whack, you know, get his belt out, bat, beat me a few times, I would have been happy. But I disappointed him. What is it? What's wrong with our relationship, he said. And that really, uh, really got to me. Even now, it still makes me emotional. He said, look, we're going to have to fix the window and you're going to have to have some consequences. So, uh, you know, your pocket money, we'll have to cut that down for a while to fix that. The window doesn't bother me. But why, why do my words to you mean nothing? What's, what's going on here? So that pushed me back to see my own heart. What's going on in my own heart? Why is my desire far more important than what my father says or my family or anything else? And, and, and this is what grace does. When God lavishes us with grace, it pushes us back into our own heart that we examine our own heart. How can God be so good to me? What's happening in my heart? What's my response? When I've got this unbelievable relationship, why would I jeopardize it? So grace pushes us back, examining our own heart, our own conscience. Not in a way that destroys us, but with a way that makes us hungry to be closer to him. I learned this from my father, who was a non-Christian. I still believe the Holy Spirit was active in that man, right? Don't worry, he still whacked me from time to time. <laughs> but what I learned was the overwhelming goodness of God just hits our heart in such a way but not only do we love, not only do we desire him, but we are pushed ever closer to him when we experience this glorious grace. So as we start this new year, we've got this opportunity right in front of us. We've got the opportunity to acknowledge and declare who we are in Christ. This is my identity and this is how I'm going to live. And we've got this opportunity to say I am going to be close to him and when his grace comes and overwhelms me I am going to receive it and I'm going to be driven closer to him so that we we are closer that we are bonded ever closer it's going to be a great year there are a few things in front of us but there are always a few things in front of us, aren't there? No matter where we are. But I know God is good. And I know that his glorious grace will lead us this year.
Why don't we pray? Lord, what an extraordinary father you are to us. And we are so thankful that we get to be your children. We are so thankful that we get to experience your glorious grace and that we are given an identity in you. As we begin this brand new year, we pray that we would live the identity that you've given us and that we would accept and reflect your grace. In your holy name, Jesus, we pray today. Amen.